You're listening to the Veteran Etc. Podcast, as there's always more to be said about a veteran. Join your host, Mike Kim, a veteran, ex-monk, season war trauma therapist, and writer, as he shares his years of research in veteran readjustment culture and the meaning of warrior life. Now, here's your host, Mike Kim. Veteran Etc. This is a show based on veteran readjustment culture. I've been working on this concept going back to the early 90s, working with veterans of all different domains. On this episode, we have the scholar, a teacher of mine, I would say a prophet within mental health, someone who's truly connected to understanding places of self, the sense of self, and the potential of self. We are privileged to have Dr. Alec Grant, and he is a veteran, and I, I can just go on and on and on, but I'm wearing this shirt today. You know me, I usually wear a, a tie, a suit, something like that, but today I must wear this shirt because this is the warrior deity of Hanuman. And if you notice the heart, the opening of the heart, oracle imagery of the self and, and how this warrior took on, you know, his society by calling for a higher level of authenticity. So we have Dr. Alec Grant, and I just want him to say some things about himself because I could go on and on and on. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, okay, well, for the last few years, last two, two, two and a half decades, I've been a, an autoethnographer. That overlap with being a, a, an academic practitioner in cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. And prior to that, I was a full time practitioner of CBT. And before that, a mental health nurse. And before that, I was in the RAF, the Royal Air Force of Great Britain. I left the Royal Air Force 50 years ago this year after serving five years. And yeah, so I'm an autoethnographer. I'm very interested in narrative. I'm very interested in the idea of storying of, of our lives as story embedded within bigger stories and the possibilities for restoring ourselves in positive directions, in the direction of a preferred narrative or a preferred identity. And I, I want to this... stop you there. Okay, you go on. You said restoring. No, no, and I want to. I want you to come back to this. But restoring, I think, is very important when I think of the veteran community, right? Because <laughs> we get the stories from from the the movies we see before, you know, march or die you know, before we join the military, right? And then yeah. we get the stories that the the superiors give towards us and our peers give to us, right? And yeah. then, and then, you know, after we leave the military, then we're back home and we get the stories that society and our parents and our wives and our partners give. And, yeah. and then you're giving something profound to me and other people because I have been doing, you know, my pre-research and research at Columbia, and you have been one person that has been instrumental in having me understand restoring. So can, can you share with our listeners and viewers about restoring? Okay, right. All right. So we come out of the military. And we're, we're bombarded with all sorts of different stories. Sometimes they're contradictory. We've, we've been bombarded with stories in the military. We've been bombarded in this with stories, sometimes kind of mythical stories, you know, Wild Westy kind of John Wayne stories, you know, about glorifying the military and so forth. Then we come out. And I think the important thing is, I'm, I'm quoting from, I'm paraphrasing George Kelly, the psychologist George Kelly, now a famous psychologist. You don't have to be a victim of other people's biographies of you. 
or other people's stories of you, right? And you, it is possible to restory yourself. And it's absolutely essential, I think, to restory yourself if you come out and you've got PTSD. Because if, if you've got PTSD, you're stuck in several ways. You're stuck in, 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 you're, you're stuck in terms of your body, you know, startle response, bad sleep, nightmares. You're stuck in terms of uh, fears and phobias about uh, places you can and can't go to. You're stuck with memories. You're stuck with sometimes guilt, sometimes survivor guilt, all these kind of things. And I think restoring yourself, and I think autoethnography is essential here, writing yourself, right? So we write, I've got a keyboard in front of me, we write not just to write up knowledge, we write to create knowledge. So when you write about yourself, you, just, you can start anywhere, just start storing yourself. You start right now or you can you go back to your time in the military or whatever and you start and you you find out things about yourself that you didn't know just <coughs> excuse me <coughs> by the motor act of writing about write, writing your story and then you can see possibilities for for restoring do i want to be stuck with this or, or are there possibilities for moving into different directions Another thing is, I'm thinking about Penny Baker or Penny Backer, who you'll know about, Mike, uh, mm -hmm. the, the great man on, on, on writing as a means of recovery from PTSD. You can, just the sheer act of writing is therapeutic in and of itself. You, 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 you move on from where you are and you move into a new preferred identity. So I, I think that along with other aspects of some things from CBT, which I know we're going to talk about later, like exposure and so forth, can be so helpful in forging ahead with a, with different <coughs> narrative of sen sense of, of, of oneself. <coughs> what if, let me tell you this, though. What if one of the listeners contacts us and he, he or she's writing a comment and says, OK, how can I restore myself even though the military has a certain way that they see me from the 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 paperwork they wrote about me or what the hospital wrote about me yeah, you know yeah. how, how, how can i how, what what's that whole thing about can i can i actually restore myself even with these different things or even as basic as how my son views me as yeah, as, yeah. as a veteran yeah I, I i think you've hit on a very important point mike there are all sorts of constraints, limitations about how much we can we can change as a person. And sometimes we're stuck in a story or narratively entrapped by people's attitudes and, and sociological and material things like our position in society, <coughs> our, our access to resources, money, benefits, etc. And by the dominant stories that are told by institutional psychiatry, by the military, etc., and by our relatives, by our sons, daughters, family, wives, friends, etc. But but even so, I still think we've got some sort of margin of freedom there. There are there are, even despite these limitations, it's not an all or none thing. There are still possibilities for change and movement. And resistance. I mean um one of my <laughs> My problems with my past, and that's why I write for critical mental health. That's why I wrote that living my narrative piece that you you mentioned earlier. It moved is, me deeply. Sorry, and I would encourage it moved me deeply. And if you are a a veteran administrator or a a VA therapist, I encourage you to find on Google search "living my narrative," storing dishonesty and deception in mental health nursing. This is very revealing to all of us, me, including me. I, I see myself at times as, you know, Mr. Mr. Veteran Therapist, Mr. You know, or the largest veteran war site facility in New York City. And yet I can accuse of all these people, of all these bad things that they're doing, you know, with veterans. And yet I can see where I've made errors, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. so I, I, 
I, I just, I was moved by that. And so can, can you say more about that? I just wanted to give some folks yeah. background on that because usually in the clinical education, you don't ever hear about that. Yeah, Not even yes. in the ethics, right? You don't, you yeah. don't hear much about that because there's right. this power, you know, clinician patient relationship, but yes. please. Sure thing. Okay. Okay. Right. If you're involved in the, in the, therapeutic systems generally and institutional psychiatry specifically as a patient or a client or whatever then you, you, you you're going to be bombarded with the, the the dominant story about what's supposed to be happening to you and what you're about and what treatment's about etc now that dominant story is always flawed because within the dominant story there are there are lies told. There are lies told by institutional psychiatry about diagnosis and how to treat uh, so-called mental illnesses. Right, the whole idea of mental illness is questionable, by the way, on psych psychiatric diagnosis from a critical perspective. But there are lies told, and institutional psychiatry is always in cahoots in an unholy alliance, an elective affinity, of, as Max Weber said, with the, the psych with the pharmaceutical industry, big pharma. So diagnoses are created, then drugs are created to, to cater for the diagnoses and big bucks ensue from that for 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 the pharmaceutical industry who who give sweeteners and these to psychiatrists and doctors and so forth. You know that. And now, dinners. And dinners, fan, yeah, yeah. Fan, fancy dinners, fancy dinners, holidays, blah de blah. I heard, and, one, uh, I heard, I heard one of them say. I mean, he was, he was, you know, getting ready to make general, and he, he's like a, a surgeon. It's it always tastes better when it's free. He made that <laughs> comment about one yeah. of, because he gets so many offers yeah. to go to these yeah, yeah. dinners. But let yeah. me, let me, let me, let you, you on, yeah. All right, now. Anyone involved in, in institutional psychiatry as a patient doesn't see that. If you think about Goffman, Goffman's metaphor of front stage, backstage, what's supposed to be going on, the dominant story, the rhetoric, the glossy mission statements, this is what we're about, mm. and the backstage, all the shenanigans and bloody awful things that happen behind the scenes, you know, the arguments and the corruption and so forth. You don't get to see that, the backstage stuff. So I think with the, I live in my narrative, storing dishonesty thing, I wanted to expose the contradictions between the front stage and the backstage. <coughs> and I wanted to kind of redeem myself as much as possible, my, my guilt about being part of the system for many years. You know, and not that it's always possible. You can't, can't, you can't absolutely unguilt or deguilt yourself. But I, I wanted to give the message, and I wanted to rattle a few cages and and and, and give a wake up call to to mental health nursing, to to be a bit more honest. You know, not to to you know to to come clean autoethnographically or on or in other methodological ways, to come clean about the whole, you know, the big picture, what's really happening, as opposed to this squeaky clean, sanitized, you know, sugar-coated, tidied up presentation of, 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 of what they're supposed to be about. Because there's an awful lot of corruption, there's an awful lot of abuse and oppression in, in the UK, for example, and, and well, in, in the, the collection of countries that make up the UK and beyond. So, Ireland is a separate country. There's loads of abuse. The, the, the Magdalene laundries in Ireland where women were young, and they only closed down in the, in the 80s, where young women from the early 20th century onwards, I believe, were, were, were often put into these Magdalene laundries or into the psychiatric system. You know, you, you could go either way. Just by, just by, you know, becoming pregnant without being married, you know. So there was a kind of unholy alliance between the parents who who felt shame and disgrace, the local medical practitioner, the 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 head of the the laundry, you know, the mother mother superior, and sometimes sometimes men that were involved, Catholic, was, to get these people put away. And some of these people spent the whole of their lives in either the laundries or the psychiatric system. 
And 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 the same is true in in Britain, where when I trained as a psychiatric nurse back in the seventies, um, there were women in the hospital that that were admitted years before. They were elderly women. They were admitted just because they had a baby out of wedlock. Now that is absolutely horrible and scandalous, and should be protested against. So. You know, these nurses that I, I mentioned when I, at the dinner party scene and in, in living my narrative who were laughing about this, the way someone's face had changed as a result of having a, a lobotomy. You know, I, I, it's just awful. It's horrible. And, and, and people need to be made aware of that. Yeah. And, and right before my next question tied to that, just so our, our, our folks they kind of know things about, you know, different, different terms, you know, like I, you know, we use bathroom and I guess you guys use it, Louvre or something. Or Louvre, no? Yeah. yeah, yeah? yeah. And, and then what is, so what is a laundry? All right. Okay. The, Mag, the, the Magdalene laundries, they, they were, they were institutions set up in Ireland and there were laundries because they, Laundries are places where you, you wash sheets, okay. you mm-hmm. know, and, and bedding and towels and all that sort of stuff. So they used to, you know, I don't know, the local hotels or, or whatever would, would send their sheets to the Magdalene Laundry and all these women would would, would work at cleaning the sheets. Yeah. Perfect. Can, 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 I, can, I, just, can yeah. I just ask you a question, Mike? Yeah. Am I allowed to swear or use expletives in this podcast or yeah. is that not? Yeah. 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 With it. Within reason, well, yeah, well, well, right. within within reason, and who knows? I, maybe, when, I, maybe when, I, when, I, when I get work, when I get worked up, I throw in the odd swear word. So. That, that's okay. That's yeah. okay. Spoiler only, alert. Only, yeah, only when you only when you get worked up. If, All right, if you okay, don't, right. If, if you use it in a very no, no, I won't, I, I won't, I won't, I won't. Right. I promise. Yeah. Right, but only if you get worked up. But, but I, I need to say something about what you just said about the laundry because. I got what you were saying in the beginning, but I couldn't believe it because of the parallels that were made on minority sailors on ships within the American Navy. So it would be Black, African American, or or West Indian Americans, or Filipinos, or Asians, or other Latinos, just basically colored brown or black people on the ship, you know, you, your job was limited just to be doing laundry or yes. in the kitchen. They were called, I think the rate, they call it a rate, the, the type of job area was steward. steward and that's, yeah. yeah. And so that's all you could do. And that, yeah. and that ended, you know, just like in, like it, I believe in this in the early seventies, if it wasn't for the 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 pioneering Admiral Zumwalt, who kind of like kind of liberalized the Navy yeah. because because there was going to be race riots within, yeah. you know, massively if 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 it wasn't somewhat controlled. But I guess what what really stuck to me in the story that you mentioned about about the the Magdalene laundries is just the parallel of how I guess those people, as well as those people on the ship, they were given a certain story, right? And so, right, right. you know, yep. And, and in that story, they're like, oh, they're serving their country, like what you were saying earlier, like the front side. But in the back side, it's like, you know, how do you feel like being in yeah. the kitchen, you know, yeah, working yeah. 23 hours, you know, yep. and 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 on a ship and under slave like conditions. Right. So, so I want to, I I want you to, because there's so many parallels here with the institution of mental health in the military and in the veteran world. Yeah. I think there, there can be this self kind of redemption. If you were, let's say a commander, you weren't in mental health, but you felt like maybe in your career you had, you know, compromise different people because of your power and authority yeah. i was just wondering are can there be parallels there as far as the different issues that you discussed in the article and in your 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 philosophy and all that yeah what, yeah. yeah 
Absolutely, uh, absolutely, there can be parallels. I think anyone who is in any way connected with or complicit, you know, guilt by association, just by being there and not protesting about any organization or system, military, religious, or otherwise, you know, secular, you know, it needs to, many will not, of course, many will just not be sufficiently aware or will rationalize to themselves just how necessary their job was and the system. You, you hear a lot of excuses like it wasn't all that bad and at least they got food and at least they got a roof over their heads and all that warmth and all that rubbish. But, you know, you're talking about participating in social death, you know, mm. death before biological death. If your life is curtailed, cut short, made less fulfilling, much less fulfilling, more restricted, so your potential and everything that you could have been, you know, all the stories that might have been about you that couldn't happen because you were stuck in a ship as a steward or you were stuck in the Magdalene laundries with a load of punitive nuns and your life slipped away and you, you reached middle age, then you reached old age and then you died. You know, you died long before that socially. Mm -hmm. You died, you know, all these non-white seamen in the, in the American Navy were subjected to social death. I would imagine, yeah. long before their biological time was up on Earth. And so, I, I, yeah, I think anyone who's complicit with it should be made. And I think this is one of the beauties of autoethnography or life writing, call it what you will, biographical writing, critical writing. You know, you, 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 and it doesn't have to be writing. It can be things like this, podcast, video, art, modality stuff, you know. Anything that, that is put out in the world to make people a bit more aware than they would otherwise be because they're complacent. I mean, most people just fit in, don't they? I mean, you t an example, take, take Germany in the 1930s after Hitler came to power, 1933 or whatever, onwards. Now, a lot of people just participated or were complicit with the slaughter and disappearance of Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, you know, all sorts of people, just by doing nothing. Sometimes they, they participated more. Sometimes they took part in the looting of their neighbours' houses. Neighbours that before Hitler, they got on all, all, all right with, they got along pretty well with. Sometimes their friends were Jews. And as soon as these people removed and went to Buchenwald or, or, or Auschwitz or other death camps or whatever, they, 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 they were looting their houses. And, you know, there was a lot of denial afterwards. Oh, we didn't know about it, etc. Oh, well, that, that's not true. You know, people were aware and, and people didn't do anything about it. In, in your country, prior to the, the, the outbreak of war, when Jews were, Jewish people were, were, were trying to get into to New York, you know, the Statue of Liberty thing, you know, Madam, what's her name? Freedom, Madam? Yeah. Yeah. Now, Lady Liberty. Yeah. Lady Liberty. Yeah. Now the idea was that everyone's welcome. You know, we're a, we're a cosmopolitan community. Everyone's welcome. Life, liberty, equality, etc. 1776 onwards. You know the the declaration and so forth. And uh, but but there were there was a you know there, there was a a ban on an official ban on on Jewish people getting in. And then after the war, Werner von Braun von Braun. A dreadful Nazi, eventually he settled in America and he got the Presidential's Medal, the President's Medal, I think, from Clinton. Uh, and he was he, he was he was a uh, what, you know one one of the most respected Americans in quotes. He worked with Walt Disney, and this guy was responsible for the slaughter and brutality and torture of loads and loads of people. So anyway, yeah. So I think I think any any form of participation. And complicity needs to be addressed. Definitely, yeah. And and, and so, <coughs> the power of the autoethnographic writing in healthcare or in the military or in the veteran terrain can be useful 
because you just gave me an example of an acute story. Yeah. And do you think that there's that there can be power in the academic world by having those stories, not just in Time magazine, but in, you know, academic writing, if someone uh -huh. wants to use that as well? Absolutely, they can. And I think autoethnography, I'm, I'm, I'm more or less quoting from Art Bochner now, my friend Art Bochner. Mm -hmm. he, he's a granddaddy of autoethnography. I mean, he, he, he said recently, I mean, autoethnography is becoming so popular now and so legitimate as an epistemic, as, as a, a resource for, for, for knowledge that, you know, we've got two handbooks now, handbook the first one, the, the handbook, then the second edition, we've got thousands of, maybe millions, I don't know, thousands and thousands of journal articles, book chapters, books. Yes, but let me ask you this. You were in one of, you wrote, you co-wrote the major one, the recent major one on doing research. And so for our researchers out there, I was just wondering if you could, share a couple things from that book so that if they okay, want to get okay. used to understanding autoethnography from a research perspective. All right. Okay. Are we talking about international perspectives and autoethnographic research and practice? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, that book was published in 2018. I did it with Tony Adams. It was a transatlantic yeah. Tony Adams, myself, Nigel Short, Lydia Turner. I, I think you've, you've, I think that's a, a kind of go-to book. It's called International Perspectives, Autoethnographic Research and Practice, published by Routledge, 2018. And the first author is Lydia Turner, Lydia Turner, Short, Grant, Adams. And that's a go-to book for for just about everything you need to know about autoethnography as a, as a methodology, as a method, the ethics of it, you know, the relational ethics, some objections to it, the need for a celebration of subjectivity. You know, under, under positivism, uh, objectivity was elevated to, you know, the be all and end all. And so subjectivity, subjective experiences, lived, lived experiences or lived through experiences were disparaged as some people call it anec data, you know, and they dismiss it like that. Now, so in the past, like veteran stories, ah, we don't, you know, ah, yeah. that's just for, that's just for like literature, red badge of courage or whatever, yeah, yeah. you know Sorry. what I mean? Ah, that's for, for a reader's digest or something like that. But yeah. Surely yeah. it can't be part of the academy. Right. But you Sorry. ended up, I found out you ended up actually doing your dissertation from a first person. We'll get into that. In yeah, I did. Yeah. The future, but please, this veteran self, this military self, can come out in autoethnography. Absolutely, and this handbook can help yeah. veterans, also students. If you're if you're a high ranking officer reading this, and you're going to the Army War College, I invite yeah. you to use that methodology when you work on yeah. on your on your thesis. You know, yeah. and I'm not Absolutely. preaching politics or anything. I'm just giving yeah. you stuff <clears throat> regarding what. Dr. Grant has been talking about in his writings. Check it out yourself. You you read the articles. He, Dr. Grant, isn't just using autoethnography, but he's giving you a lens from all these different philosophical perspectives as well as sociological perspectives, very, you know, cultural studies, very interdisciplinary. Yeah. As far as the world is moving, that's where it's moving. So yes. for the military slash veteran researcher, even if you don't have your whole dissertation or your book project focus on autoethnography, you can mesh yeah, autoethnography absolutely. with your statistical work and all that to make sure it better. You can. Sure you can. Mixed methodology, mixed methods. Absolutely. Completely agree with you, Mike. Absolutely. That's right. And, and, and the only reason why I took, you know, so many minutes to discuss this is to ask you more about that, more about as far as how can a researcher, we're going to go back to the 
a nitty gritty community, but I want to escape a little bit into the research community because we have researchers and we have clinicians who are also researchers listening. How, how can someone, you know, if they're a researcher and they're just so caught up with that objective empirical kind yeah, yeah. of enlightenment yep. thinking, how yep. could they, how can they kind of unlearn as, as Dr. Baldacino said, kind of unlearn, unlearn that and then go into the realm that you're talking about. I'm going to shut up and give you the floor on that. All right. Okay. Now I'm going to, I'm going to suggest another book in a minute. Okay. If I can find it, uh, uh, so bear with me. Let me, uh, as you look, I'm going to talk about some of the things that you've done in all regards right. to you, you um, do that but, and oh, I found yeah. it. Sorry. Okay, okay. Great. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Now I think, a good start, before you read the International Perspectives book that I've just mentioned, a good start is to have a look at this book. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. So it's Oxford University Press, Tony Adams, Stacey Holman Jones, Carlin Ellis, Autoethnography, and it was published 2015, I believe. Now, that that is a, a very good... It's a less demanding read than the the International Perspectives book because the International Perspectives book assumes that you've got some oh, prior yeah. knowledge. I, th I, th I think yeah, I think you do have to unlearn, or maybe just put it respectfully on one side. You do have to unlearn <coughs> popular views about what constitutes social scientific research. So social scientific research according to dominant understandings up until fairly recently is about positivism it's about objectivity it's about quantity of experimental research yeah it's about distance you know yes. removing yourself from your data and so on not contaminating it now quality of research generally takes an opposite stance and autoethnographic research goes much farther so we're talking about prizing subjectivity, you know, celebrating subjectivity, mm -hmm. celebrating lived or lived through experience. We're talking about concern for meaning, meanings, values, uh, significant moments in one's life or epiphanies, things that we're stuck with. And we're stuck with a lot in PTSD, aren't we? We're stuck as people. And, and putting into the knowledge domain or epistemic domain to, to, to use a fancy philosophical word knowledge putting into the knowledge domain the hugely valuable reported represented written experiences of veterans not and it's not just focusing on individual experiences it's making as you know mike it's making connections between my own experiences and the broader cultural experiences so my 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 veterinary journey in relation to, uh, to the veterinary journey of loads of other people that have been through the u.s military and and and, and have come out with issues and damage as a result of that and, and 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 going further than that looking at so so we're talking about from narrow stories if you like my story to broader cultural stories, to broader, broader cultural stories. So in what way does the political, economic, cultural, social system of the U.S.? Let me give you an example that you can help me with, for right, example, okay. because you're making, you're, making, you're making a lot of sense here. And I want folks to also understand, like I said before, the complex issues about this and also how to operationalize it. Okay, yeah. Joe Schmuckatelli, he's a he's a he's a private or a, a, a low ranking kind of guy, and um, he's just a real good soldier, really good soldier. But he gets a call, you know, on 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 base, and you get like or on a, a installation, you get the, you know, you can get weekends off if there's not like a you know a a, a war going on or any kind of training. So get you get liberty, you know, forty eight hour liberty. And he hears his grandmother. He's African American. He's young. He gets he gets caught up in going to his sick grandmother who raised him, and you know, 
it's the 48 hours are, are up and then the commander is basically saying or his eo is is saying hey you gotta you gotta get back and yeah 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 and the, and the guy doesn't get back right okay so yeah, yeah. he doesn't get back and then there's automatic administrative you know military punishment as well as a lot of times extrajudicial that can happen as well and so you know there's a disconnect between that soldier's real life experience right uh -huh, with uh -huh. his other you know military life and the relationships with his superiors i'm just wondering it if this guy ends up going into the academy how could he look at that as being auto ethnographic fuel oh, oh absolutely could okay he could start off by he, he could start to write about his his family concerns and experience in that specific event with his with his grandmother was it and and how that cut so that's one story and then the other story is is, is the military story they're, they're overlapping stories you know mm. of course they yeah, wow. the, the the other the other story is the, is is the military story, and how he's caught up in that, and how the military story is only partially sympathetic mm. to his family story, mm. and and the tensions between the two, and you know the 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 and 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 what that does to not just him, but to his family. And to to the military and how the military how the military kind of responds to I mean you, 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 if your grandmother or or any other family member or loved one is dying you know the, the idea of getting a forty eight hour pass well you don't have forty eight hours of grief do you mm -hmm. anticipatory wow. grief you don't have it's not it's not just bounded it just doesn't stop. Right, I've got to go back to base now. You know, my, my pass is up, so I've got to go back to base now. And so I stopped grieving. So that the, the 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 family ties, the family affections, affiliations, and so forth, might be stronger than you know than 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 respect for the military or military affiliations, uh, one's sense of duty, and so forth, and is the sense of duty that comes from the military re in and of itself sufficient to outweigh all the other uh, allegiances that you have to family etc so i think that would make a great study that would be that would be super yeah. and, and it would tease out some of the you know you could look at so you could start off with that and then you can look at attitudes if there were if he had like access. That, that, could i could he I, I mean i say i know of this story from someone I, i'm going right. to keep it i'm going to keep it private but sure it, yeah it could be a she or he but i, I know yeah. of the situation that happened could he use certain artifacts like um the punishment paper or like yeah. uh, yeah. any yeah. type of yeah, uh, yeah. You know, the commander's email to him. Yeah, or yeah, something yeah. Like that as, yeah, as also yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, he could. There's, there's two issues here, Mike. One, one is, yes, yes, very, very much so he could use that. There are relational ethical issues here. So you'd have to, yeah. you'd probably have to disguise identities or, or, you know, change dates and times and so forth. There's also a, I mean, so far, I think <laughs> implicitly, most of the time, We've been talking about men, haven't we? There's a huge gender issue here. So, you know, women, it's, they're going to have, they're going to, they're going to be overlapping problems. Yeah. Gay, but, lesbian, military, yeah, as well as Yeah, trans. yeah. Okay, yeah. trans, gay, lesbian, women. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, they're going to have. And, and even, and I would even stretch this out, even, even white, even white uh, yeah. uh, troops that, you know, may be in a, mixed caught up in the middle type of situation so, so uh, yeah. Ab ab absolutely yeah so okay so the question would be so if we go back to joe so joe's writing mm -hmm. joe could start to think about and he's and he's autobiographic account how would the situation have been different if he were josephine oh. if, or if he were if he were white or if he were brown or or or, or korean or Latino, or if he were trans, or if he were 
a gay or if, if he was a lesbian woman, how, how would things have been handled differently? I mean, would, 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 the, would the procedures, the disciplinary, disciplinary procedures, have been affected by gender, sexuality, race, class, et cetera, et cetera? If he'd have been an officer, Oh, right. or, you know, yes. et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So, you know, all these things are, are useful to think about and to write about. And they, they invite in the readers. I mean, because <laughs> you're going to get all, all sorts of readers of that kind of work. You know, you're going to get gay, you're going to get non-gay, you're going to get lesbian, trans, et cetera, et cetera. So y you want to enable them to f feel part of the conversation. So I, I, I think you've got to you know, and this is this is the whole thing about reflexivity, about thinking about your thinking. I was you know, I was going to ask you about that. Let me stop you. That was actually one of my main questions. Some people, uh, and and you're a scholar, can you explain when people use that term reflexivity, what that what that means? Yeah, exactly. Okay, reflexivity means precisely when you're writing. Yeah being critical about the about the place you're writing from about the subject of experiences so you need to think about your thinking you need to have a dialogue with yourself in your head why am i writing this as a straight black male exclusively and am i ex am i so it's really about thinking about thinking what the question always is what do i think about the way i think right and that's a critical question so it's not you, the answer isn't oh i i love the way i think bloody blah, blah, blah you know so i'm pretty handsome i'm very handsome yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, the 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 issue is to and and not just being reflexive about oneself but being reflexive about the cultures that you write about so the domestic culture were things all that great with my grandmother? I mean, do I love her all that much? Was I was I using not going back to base as a you know as a bereavement excuse, or did I just not want to go back to base? Right, right, right. So I could right. hang out with my pal. Right, um, that's true. And 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 also military cultures. What's so great about military cultures? You know, who does the, the who do the rules serve most? Mm -hmm. uh, are they are they biased in favor? Are they racially biased in favor of, of of whites? I would imagine they are. They always are. And and uh, I, and, and I would uh, say, and, uh, it's, 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 sorry, and sexually biased, gender biased uh, in yeah. favor of straights. I would say yes, they always are. Yes, bloody, but... yes. I mean, you say that in a very in interesting way to me because as I become reflexive, I am thinking the uniform code of military justice was started during the civil rights movement in 1958. So, really? so the American okay. judicial system for the military, you know, in the past, it, there was no separate, you know, the Supreme Court had to treat cases, you know, military cases uh, equally. But right. during the civil rights and integrated military, all of a sudden you have a certain system. I'm not saying that system is completely horrible, but there's got to be some type of bias there. And, uh, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. So so that's another good way of thinking about reflexivity. What are my personal biases that favor myself? What are my bias? What are my the biases I've just internalized about the, the military and the biases I've internalized about family, duty to family, you know, etc. Mm -hmm. And do I really feel that way to the do I really feel that way? Or or can I deconstruct my biases? Do I need to go along with my biases? Can I argue against my biases, etc.? That's reflexivity, and oh, you read all about reflexivity in in, in the books I've, I've mentioned so far. Yeah, too. that's that's awesome. That's awesome. And also, I encourage folks to check out the YouTube video if you you YouTube search autoethnography Alec Grant. He'll be on several interviews. There's a great thirty minute interview that will mirror this interview and it's it's a it's just a fine interview you gave yeah that's that's that that one is qualitative conversations is is probably the best one that's from a few yes. years back but it's qualitative conversations alec grant yeah yes yeah. yes and and so 
can you in that interview there was something that you said and it was in regards to health care but i think it could also fit with a military command structure you know outside of race and, and 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 gender and all of that you know as well as including that so in being in the in and out of all of that as well as in that military health care system and all these other systems of of you know in society you know you had mentioned a term that i think is quite interesting in that interview and it was the the, the term was a fundamental attribution error yeah okay yeah you want me to explain that yeah, for our listeners, because I think this episode, and I know we're going to do a series of episodes in the future, but this is a general orientation for the veteran and military person, as well as the clinician and the civilian, to maybe situate him or herself or themselves to a place in, you know, re, re, reconstructing the self or restoring the self as you yes, were talking yes. about, and then also how it's tied to systems and institutions. Right. And right. I just found that one set of words that you use to be profound. And I, okay. I just wanted you to share that with them right. because right. I picked up a lot from it. Right. Okay. Fundamental attribution error. And by the way, you can, you can Google that. Anyone can Google it and, and there'll be definitions come out. But, but the way I was using it, I was thinking the film was, imagine you're in a system, right? You, imagine you're, you've got PTSD and you're in a vet and you, you, you get stuck in a, a whole psychiatric unit, a, a ward in a psychiatric unit that's supposed to be treating you. Now, the, the staff of the ward are going to see your behaviour and make attributions about it, all right? Mm. Now, the very first thing, it's a bit like prejudice. In fact, I think it belongs to the family of prejudice. Mm. So the way they see you, they'll see your behavior in a prejudicial way. They'll make judgments about you. This is the fundamental bit. At the start, you know, as soon as they meet you, maybe after they've known you for an hour or two or a day or so, they'll start to make form judgments about after, you. After I throw the chair across the room. Because, after you throw... After you th uh, because yeah, they, yeah. They, they started calling me a certain... N yeah, name exactly. or something, or, or stereotype <coughs> as, as, as you, being deviant yeah, or something. Absolutely. After you throw a chair across the room, or, or or you throw a punch at somebody, or whatever, mm -hmm. because of the way you've been treated, they'll start to label you in a certain way, and then now fundamental attribute. That's so. That's the attribution they make at the start. Fundamental attribution error. And then that fits in with confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is anything that you do subsequently that fits their developing theory about who you are, prejudicial, their prejudice view about who you are. So, you know, whatever you do after that, you know, if you, so if you, if you don't come for your meds on time <laughs> or, you, or whatever, you know, oh, that's, that's typical of him. He's a, and they'll start to call you all sorts of names. You're a psychopath, you're this, that. So they'll add to, your official diagnosis with other names about you, other adjectives about you, other, you know, social judgments about you. And so, um, and you can't, and it's hard to avoid that. It's in, in, in ordinary life, it's hard to avoid that, you know, you know, so I'll get things like, oh, he's an autoethnographer. He's bound to think that, or he's an autoethnographer. He's, 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 you know, he's, he's involved in he's just a storyteller or whatever you know and and it, it and if the thing about prejudices dishes prejudices which includes fundamental attribution or confirmation bias is prejudices give people a, a, an excuse not to think further than that not to try to find out not to not to challenge their prejudices so if you're the guy that's thrown the chair across the room and doesn't come for your meds the nurses <laughs> I've got a judgment about you and they're not going to be quick to say to the, each other, well, are we really being fair? Should we give this man a chance or this woman a chance or whatever? Shall we, are there reasons behind his behavior apart from just, he's a, he's a fucking troublemaker. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are, are there, are, are there, are there, are there reasons? What might the reasons be? Let's have a look at ourselves. So fundamental attribution tends to exclude the person making the judgments. What is it that I'm doing 
or we are doing that makes this man, woman, whatever, behave in this way? Are we are are we are we part of the are we co-creating the circumstances whereby he gets angry? Is there someone we could could we apologize for for sticking labels on him? Could we could we say, okay, look, I'm sorry, Joe, Mike, Josephine, Jolene, could, could we could we start again? Look, I want to try and get to know you. I want to try and understand you. I want to hear your subjective lived through experiences. Mm. That is something that up to now across the globe, with certain exceptions, institutions and institutional staff are not doing very well. They're not ready. To, they're more likely to act on the basis of a diagnosis or, or fundamental attribution or confirmation bias. And, and the labels they, sub, they stick upon a person. They're more likely to act on those than, than find out about a person's experiences and, 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 and think about why they're behaving in that kind of way. Now, I didn't use that in my comprehensive doctoral exam because I hadn't come across it, but nor in my uh, doctoral dissertation proposal, but you're bringing in something that I'm going to look at in the future, but you're also bringing back memories of when I wrote about you in my proposal and in my certification exam, you know, because I, I really didn't have much direction with my original, not my new dissertation advisor. And this isn't to trash the old one, but just to point out the reality. Yeah. And so you were helpful when I read, I'm going to get the book and I included this part because it's tied to the fundamental attribution of error. Okay. Yeah. Stand by for one second. I'm going to get sure, the sure. book because there's a part of it that is tied to what we're talking about and okay, um, it's useful. Sure. Okay. Yep. So, so you write um, profoundly in our encounters with madness. Yeah. And, yeah. So in the beginning, you write about, you know, the, the impact on stories in that marginalized people can, um, you know, they, they become this fixed kind of like identity by, yes. by society. And, yes. and I, the reason why I say that is, you know, the military person, the, the veteran, you know, the, the, the disabled veteran you know, the family member of the veteran, you know, that can, that marginality, I'm, I'm going to try to find the, the interesting word that you use to describe it, but can you say some things about that as I look for that word? How yeah, you... yeah, I can. I, I think that people that are marginalized, people that are othered, othered as a verb, are often stuck they are, they are, I use the term narratively entrapped, entrapped in a story, trapped within a story. They're often, in the eyes of others, in the eyes of society and institutions and organisations, they are stuck in that story. <coughs> they can't be anything else, mm. other. they can't be anything else than the othered identity, the marginalised identity that they've been accorded by society, institutions, etc. So no matter what they do, often they, they are stuck in that identity. And that's another reason why, but that doesn't mean to say that they, they are condemned to be stuck in that identity forever. They mm -hmm. can autoethnographically work, work their way out of that by constructing a, a new identity. Sometimes an oppositional identity or a resistant identity, you know, a kind of fuck you identity this is who i am yeah? yeah i don't care what you what you say about me is not who i am and sometimes that that kind of resistant or oppositional identity goes along with certain actions so there are people who say i'm not going to take these meds anymore i'm not saying that medication is bad or anything like that i'm just saying that sometimes it's useful and people do it. I did it myself a few years back because I was labelled with bipolar one identity I rejected. I'm not going to take these meds anymore. I don't need 
the meds and I don't need institutional psychiatry and I don't need the, the, the assaults, the violence to my biographical identity that you try to impose on me. So, you know, I think you can, you can unstick yourself from, from being trapped in a story, a story that's imposed on you by the military, by, you know, the, the hospital. The, the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and, and I found it, I found it because I had to include this because yeah. what you were saying, you know, you used it as far as, and it touched me, S stigmatized groups or people are labeled as unwanted. They're spoiled identities, constantly excluding them from full social acceptance and yeah, membership yeah. of dominant groups. That's, yeah. that's your, that's your original, that's your original writing. And yep. so spoiled, I do feel, you know, at times uh, as, as a veteran, as you know, now we don't have any wars going on. You know, I can't get a free dinner, you know, you know, at the restaurant because of wearing a uniform. I didn't really do that, but I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, you I know mean, what I'm saying? The yellow do, ribbons yeah. aren't flying anymore, sure, but, yeah. but now, you know, I'm hearing more and more articles about, you know, gosh, why should we be spending money on 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 veterans yeah. you know let's yeah. cut the budget and everything yeah, yeah. but That's spoiled right. when when i read yeah. that when yeah. i read yeah. that spoiled <clears throat> yeah, yeah please yeah. please go on oh absolutely well well spoiled identity i think originally comes from irving goffman his work you know quite a lot on spoiled identity you can just google irving goffman spoiled identity right Let's but the up. way you used it though yeah, yeah, yeah. The way I, I, I mean, yeah, the, the way I used it is 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 influenced by Goffman, but I use uh -huh. it in my own kind of way. Yes, I think so. What you're talking about there is thanks for correcting me, by the way. No, no, that's okay. Don't worry. No, no. What you're talking about there is the 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 interesting relationship between one's experience. I can't get there's no yellow ribbons anymore. I can't get free dinners. I'm in uniform respect for the militaries on the on the on the going south you know because of political mm. actions you know the 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 the, the, uh, the the latest government in the usa starts to say starts to starts this story and the press pick it up and then various other you know Often right wing groups pick it up, and they're and, rewriting and, their they're restoring uh, themselves. Yeah, right? and they're restoring the past. The, the the past narrative was was you know tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree, blah de blah. Yeah. Uh, you know, respect for the military, John Wayne, etc., and the equivalent in other countries in the UK. And now the new narrative, which is taken up by the press, and politics, and culture, and and then ordinary people because they read the media. They start to to think this. Well, you know, it's no big deal being in the military, you know. So why why are we treating them like you know they deserve all sorts of things, you know? And and uh, so and go back to Joe and his granny grandmother. Mm -hmm. So he gets disciplined for for breaking his leave. Now maybe mm -hmm. I don't know in nineteen fifty or just mm -hmm. after the Second World War, when the war was over and Joe wasn't. Joe had to go back home. I can, I can, I've got an image of, I don't know, John Wayne or, or some American actor going back home, Alan Ladd or some, going back home to his granny and then coming back late and getting disciplined. And there'd be outrage on the streets. People would say, that's awful. It's his granny, you know, and he's done his duty and bloody blah, blah. So why are you punished? Now I can imagine them saying, God, you know, do we really want this man or woman as as in our in our services you know if they can't yeah you know if they can't stick to the rules and so on so you know the the, the stories change yes. don't they the narratives change so but i think what one thing that's that never seems to change very much is mental health patients of whatever background whether in the military they've got ptsd or whatever the the, the you know, there's one story that they're valuable and they need treatment and, and return to society. There's another story is that they're always going to be outsiders. They're always going to be 
have spoiled identity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're, they're never really going to be worthwhile, mm -hmm. viable human beings again. And that's a, that's an awful, that's a really disgraceful, horrible, condemning social death. Yes, social death. Uh, social death, yeah. <laughs> Social death, I, I saw it over and over and over again, working with Vietnam veterans and yeah. uh, still, you know, and, and I'm not one to glorify militarism. My my stepmother was Vietnamese. She died prematurely of Agent Orange. So I have a lot well, of okay. mixed feelings regarding yeah. you know, being Asian American and wearing a uniform and yeah. being called names, you know, yeah, in the yeah. past. I bet. So, yeah. you know, so I don't. I don't, I don't want to glorify, but at the same time, I acknowledge the pain yes. that a Vietnam vet or a Korean war vet may be yeah. experiencing because of uh, the, that spoiled identity. And, yeah. and in that, I, I find that, as you say, narratives, narratives change, you yeah. know, there's we covered the, that negative, that negative change. What I've seen with the positive change, and it doesn't happen often. I just saw a slight blink of this when during the war on terror, you know, I think we learned a lot about Vietnam veterans and addictions and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so they, they did a lot to help promote by being authentic about their readjustment issues. I think that led even the veteran hospitals, not so much in the military, but in the veteran hospitals to recognize that even if you were caught with, you know, drugs in the military and, and, and you were let out of the military dishonorably, we're still going to treat you. That narrative, that reality came from a narrative with the Vietnam vet, not saying all Vietnam vets were addicted or anything like that, but those who were became a, a, a social, you know, phenomenon that just the country really struggled with, you know, yes, and, yes. and then the veterans hospital and a couple, I guess, administrators decided to say, Hey, if you get caught with this type of stuff and you come back, will still will still take care of you. It took some time. Yeah. I saw I saw some guys get rejected. Yeah. You know, they were fighting in Fallujah and some of you know highly yeah. decorated guys. And yeah, yeah. they were not given service. As the yeah. war progressed, I think yeah. that the whole v Vietnam narrative came back to us for a slight moment to show that type of empathy. I've I've got something to say about that, but can I just nip to the the toilet? Yeah. Can I yeah. yeah. And I'm gonna talk okay, while you're gone. And then you come back. I'm just going to talk about some of the things that, you know, were tied to you and, and some of the stuff that I'm into. Okay. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. So, so with Dr. Grant, I gave an audio essay about his life and really, you know, it didn't capture the different themes that we've engaged on this episode. And Truly, you know, when looking at, you know, veteran stories, military stories, even if, you know, you're a child of a veteran or spouse or partner or friend, these stories are to be valued. And as he explained, it, it's, it's not so much, you know, downgrading one's story or downgrading another person's story but it's kind of like looking at the tension of stories and he dr grant was able to kind of like speak about that so i don't want people to think that we have some type of political agenda or that we're you know trying to promote some type of ideology of wokeism even though i might feel woke at certain times when I wake up in the morning or when I go to church, you know, and I, and I hear a good gospel song, but, you know, don't take these things that come to the show as some type of political agenda. We are talking about 
the different tensions of stories. And I just mentioned something of, you know, a, 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 I don't know if I could say positive story, but something that was a story of efficacious healthcare narrative I just gave you tied to service delivery for certain veterans that may have what's called bad paper, you know, from the Vietnam veteran, bad paper was given to veterans that were in trouble, you know, either in the AWOL situation I spoke about regarding Joe Schmuckatelli or Joanna Schmuckatelli or a bigger offense, you know, you know, being caught up in a lot of trouble, you end up getting discharged and get bad paper. You're considered, you know, somewhat of a pariah in our society where employment becomes very difficult. And as mm -hmm. what Dr. Grant had said about, you know, culture, society, politics, the media, we're not, we're not talking Alex Jones conspiracy issues. We're, we're talking about larger realities that are occurring that are tied to a, a common reality that we have. And we're just talking about the exchange of all these different realities and stories. And so that's why I truly wanted to have Dr. Grant on here, because a lot of times all of these military stories can be competitive or they can be, you know, degrading because of different politics. And, you know, this episode kind of moves away from that. And it's just looking at the power of storing and restoring. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just pick up on, on, on what we were talking about before I, I, I disappeared just now. The, 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 uh, w w when I was out in Germany in the Air Force in 71, 72, 73, I, I, I met it was before the the Hanoi was it at the end of the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and I used to go to Fort Flint Caserne, which was in Bavaria. I was in a, an exhibition drill squad, and the brief was to to teach American servicemen some advanced drill moves and stuff. And I mixed with some got some guys that were on R and R. I think that's what's called yeah. from from Vietnam, and yeah. and and I was struck by. They were nice, you know, nice, nice fellows. And, and I'm struck by how, you know, if someone comes, and it happened in this country too, someone's come, someone comes back from, from the Gulf or Afghanistan or Iraq with a drug or Vietnam for about 50 years back with, with drug problems, with addiction problems, alcoholism or drugs, other forms of drugs. They destroy the kind of ideology of, you know, the, the, the reliable moral soldier, you know, and, and they also show society, they also make society feel guilty because, you know, my, my appearance on the streets as a homeless vet uh, with that addiction problems <coughs> is a, reminds you, it's a smack in the face reminder that that my my service for you damaged me and lots of other people, and so society gets in a state of denial about that. And what they do is they blame you, they bl blame the vet, you know. And and so I think that's why, with with, with reference to the Vietnam War, and that that's why a lot of people coming back from Vietnam didn't get the kind of social support back then that they deserved and needed. Aside from the rights or the wrongs of the of the war, you know, and 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 so, and I think society kind of looked at them and said, "We don't want you on our streets reminding us of just how awful the experience in Vietnam was for you, you know, <laughs> and still is." Yeah. So so yeah. let's let's ignore you. Let's not let's pretend that you you don't have needs. You know, I'm stating this in an extreme yeah. way, but you know what I mean. Yeah. I think something like that always goes on, you know. Yes. So, yes. so, yeah, so vets never get, never get the, the you know, the post-military, post-conflict service, the services they need. So it's, a un, in many ways, we're kind of talking about an unstable reality in that type of narrative, whereas the movies can show... Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, he. We're taking care of them. The Wounded Warrior Project, you know, that yeah, yeah. private organization that raises millions, 
And I'm yeah, not saying they're bad or anything, but they have had some controversy. You know, we're, we've done this, we've done that. And uh, hey, you know, they served our country. So, uh, hey, we're doing it. Yeah, so exactly. That's like a certain type of narrative, you know. That's that's a certain type of narrative. That That's the glossy, that's the front stage, go back to Goffman. That's the glossy kind of sanitized. This is all the lovely things we're doing that yeah. ignores. Now, yeah. I want to get, you know, before we end for now, because we're going to have some more discussions in the future. Yeah, certainly. Free, yeah. When you're free. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know you're open on a lot of things, but I know you have a lot of different engagements, but when you're free and once I absolutely, my absolutely. Doctorate at the Royal Air Force Club in Britain, I'm going to take you there and, and we're going to celebrate, you know, well, that'll be great. to, to 2024, 2025. So, Thank you. Yeah. And so in between that time, we're going to have more shows with you on. Yes, certainly. And I wanted to ask you about this, going back to the soldier and going into redemption and bringing it back to, again, that article that moved me in regards to being honest and maybe being, you know, whatever, you know, redemptive about yourself. I'm talking about you, me, others, including officers who may not have always done the right thing or, or whatever, right. or just want some clarity right. and conscious. Now I'm going to break that down and I wanted to get your view on this case study that was, that actually did happen. And that is, I had a Vietnam vet and this was like a, after, you know, a lot of Vietnam vets were, were recognized and everything, you know, finally, yes. and, and, and uh, they were starting to come in to get treatment. And I was working with one of them and he was saying, you know, I was in combat and I was doing this and I was doing that. And no. and then he was saying that he was dragging bodies in into the ba body bags. He was part of uh, mortuary services, yes. the Marines. And he had, uh, he had this particular narrative of doing that and describing that. And uh, so we, we had treatment for about three years, you know, and towards the end, well, not, I think I had to be transferred. I think I transferred out, but right, right before I ended, I mean, we were able to kind of finish treatment in a way, but, you know, he said to me, you know, I lied to you. I wasn't in mortuary services and I, I held it, you know, as his clinician. And I was like, well, can you tell me, you know, while you were there in Vietnam, because you were there in Vietnam, you know, can you tell me about, you know, what, what you actually did? And uh, he felt so relieved and we had these numerous sessions that he kind of felt freed and he was explaining certain things that he, he did experience certain things that he wasn't aware of, like that there were some, some, some mortar attacks from like the, from the Vietnamese military, North Vietnamese military. And, you know, he was exposed to being, you know, in, in a kind of risky kind of area, but it may not have been as gruesome as that mortuary yes. image, right? And I don't know what his intention was. Was it for a benefit? Was it for attention? Who knows? But I wasn't, I wasn't really going to shame him. Sure. And I was just wondering in regards to a veteran or a military person that might be struggling with that, or even a doctor, right. Who, who might, I don't know, stretch out the story of, I saved all these lives and, and all this stuff. Yes. You know, how, how is something like that, you know, as far as dealing with the self from yeah. kind of your perspective, how can we talk about that? I'm speculating now, Mike, but I think one of the things, some of the things that might ha that happened to explain that is the, the the man might have been compensating, trying to make his sense of self, including self-esteem, better, enhancing it by giving a, a kind of a, a, a story that that made his military experiences more you know, 
glam glamorize them more than actually happened. So he might have had a <coughs> a fairly banal, relatively risk free time in Vietnam. I don't know, speculating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he wanted to make and and sometimes because sometimes people feel guilty about that. What why didn't I have a worse time? Mm -hmm. So if I if I didn't have a worse time and I'm I'm talking to my therapist, Mike, I don't want to just tell him any old, I don't want to tell him what really happened mm. because it's he might think oh, I'm you know I, I had an easy time of it so I'll I'll I'll, I'll jazz it up I'll I'll make it more more gruesome than it actually was more grim than it actually was so that's one thing another thing is related to that he might be haunted by so there's a kind of su survivor guilt element to that yeah so and, and, and it goes back to like our society right because they're expecting everyone yeah. to be a hero everyone yeah to everyone's got to be grenade. that's right everyone to wear I the know. green beret and yeah and, yeah. You know, yeah yeah and to be in the sas and you know yeah, my yeah. favorite movie yeah. when i was a kid was the final option i don't know it was yeah. about the british yeah. sas yeah and, yeah yeah and, and, yeah. and all yeah. of this yeah. stuff and, yeah. and and that's stories being placed on yeah. all veterans. Abs you know? Absolutely, you can't just be in the military, right? And just 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 be, just just have <laughs> just have an ordinary time. You've got to be a, a, a hero, you know. You've got to be you know, you've got to be a John Wayne character, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's right. I, I, I think you know, and a lot of the time, as you know, it's it's not all that glamorous. Yeah. It's e just ordinary, even, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, and that, that, that people say to me, you know, even still to this day, they used to do it a lot when I was a lot younger. They, used, they say to me, what, 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 you know, when I, when I tell them I was in the Air Force, the RAF, oh, did you fly planes? No, no, I didn't fly planes. I sometimes flew in planes, but yeah. I didn't fly them, you know. Yeah. And so whenever in the Air Force, it's got to be, it's got to be a pilot, you know. It's, it's ridiculous, you know. Yeah. I had one of, one of, one of, when I had the group therapies that, you, that, that, which you said was really interesting because it really opened up when I had a group therapy, when I first got into the field with a bunch of Vietnam, hardened Vietnam veterans, yeah. and one just gets up and says, you know, why does everyone have to be a Navy SEAL or, yeah, 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 or yeah, right. Gray, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And, and he said, you know, I just, I was just a, artilleryman but like i didn't have any kind of pins or medals or anything like that and yeah. I, I just like what you're saying that is i thought the group felt really kind of relaxed to be able to kind of like not talk about you know all these different things that may have been true may have not been true may have been something in the middle but it's just yeah. interesting that we're talking about that because right, right. even though we're talking about it in a clinical from a clinical perspective it has a lot of truth in regards to that guy we meet in the yeah, bar yeah, yeah. right yeah and, and, yeah and, absolutely yeah, yeah it does. and how we exchange stories about yeah, our military yeah. service right, right? All, all all stories are interesting even dishonest stories because dishonest yeah. stories often have a grain of truth to them or they've got some reasoning behind them or yeah. there's some reason why that why the, the story's less than truthful. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, definitely. Yes. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I I I'm interested in doing a show with you in the future that's going to be strictly about the military as far as the fundamental attribution of error in regards to that, because I think a lot of folks here would appreciate it as we look yeah. at. A lot of the race, gender, othering, as well as yeah. the issue of like white troops and 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 locating them in in not you know a demonizing kind of way, right? And, yeah, yeah. And, and 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 those folks that are either one or the other group politically, but to a certain extent, you know, how to kind of like put that together in a certain kind of way of understanding from a narrative perspective. I would be really interested in hearing that. Sure thing, Mike. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. Absolutely and then, we will. And then I, I want some last words from you, but before the, some last words, if you could share, you know, some of your present projects, some of your projects that are upcoming. And also if anyone 
wanted to just contact you. I know you've got like, uh, I mean, you're not just into the world of mind. You're also, you know, you have a rich family life. You have, you know, a musician, you know, you, you're an artist, you know, visual artists, you get into all these different projects. And so how can people kind of like, maybe, you know, check some of your stuff out? You know. Okay, right. Okay, right. My, my 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 projects at the moment. I'm just just about to submit to Routledge an edited volume. Big uh, so Grant, now. Yeah, Alec Grant edited, and it's called Writing Philosophical Autoethnography, wow. and it's the first volume that that tries to marry philosophy with autoethnography. Nice. It's got loads of people in it that you know, Art Bochner, a few others. And that's going off. That should be published either later on this year or early next. Writing, I'm editing another book, Autoethnographies of Psych in Psychology and Mental Health, New Voices. And that's a collection of absolutely new people to autoethnography. Absolutely new. They haven't, you know, they're going from scratch. So that's, uh, that's, that's another Routledge text. There's another one, Meaningful Journeys, Stories of Self-Discovery. Mm identity and self-discovery that's that includes stories of pilgrimage mm. so that's another autoethnography book i'm very happy for people to make contact with me you've got my email address mike okay. but my, my, I'll my share email that. On, the, share that. on the link yeah share that on the link yeah i'm very happy to, for people to contact me and uh, also do you mind if they on social media are you accessible also to see some of your art uh, or some of the yeah, sure things. thing. If you, I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook, Alec Grant, on Facebook, and Alec Grant. I can't remember the. I've got, I've got an art Facebook page, okay. paintings by Alec Grant. I think it's called. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm on Twitter too. Okay. Doctor Alec Grant, all okay. one word. Dr. Alec Grant. So I'm very, yeah, absolutely, and. Um, you know, can I say, I've, I've really enjoyed this morning, Mike. It's always great you. talking to you. I've enjoyed our relationship through the years and helping you. Yeah, and, yeah you and have. Working you, with you. It's have. fantastic. Yeah, great. Yeah, so, when, when, when I was kind of on my hill, you know, just getting overrun when my, you know, just all, you know, autoethnography had not blown up. And, yeah. and I found you. And, you know, what I tell everyone is, you know, I just asked if I could talk to him. You know, that's all I wanted to talk to someone yeah, about yeah. autoethnography and you <laughs> sure were thing. you were very open about i could call you on the phone and we yeah, spoke yeah, on the definitely. phone for about a, a good hour to talk about autoethnography and about self and how that's connected to the veteran and how i could use that as a methodology and everything and uh, you had done an incredible amount uh, for me you you Catherine ellis was very human carolyn Carolyn Ellis, Carolyn yeah, yeah. Ellis was very humane towards me in the beginning yes. when learning about autoethnography, but you kind of really took that on with me in a very special place because of you being a veteran, but not only that, you yeah. being a clinician, you being also someone intrigued by philosophy and, and a yes. philosopher in your own right. Yes. Doing all of these things, kind of that weave was really, really the glue between yeah, us. So great. I thank you for for all of that. I thank, thank you, you, Mike. Thank, yeah, and the feelings mutual. And uh, yeah, so this is veteran, etc., and this is under the umbrella of coming home well. And we have just interviewed Dr. Alec Grant, and we will have him in the future. And I'm going to powwow with him and we're going to discuss different things that might be helpful to veterans, active duty people, family members, friends of veterans, the whole question of the veteran civilian divide from an autoethnographic narrative, highly interdisciplinary perspective. And we're not going to charge you. We could, but we're not. So have a great time. I can't wait to reconnect with you and you've just done so much for the show. Thanks. All right, Mike, all the best, all the best everyone. Okay. Thank Take you. Take care. Go well. Cheers.
Veteran Etc. invites you to join us again with your host, Mike Kim, every Sunday. If the content from this podcast is informative to you, please share the podcast with others. Give a like and or post something you learned from the episode on social media. If interested in other truly informative podcasts like Veteran Etc., check out ComingHomeWell.com for a listing of other veteran-based podcasts. Thank you for tuning in.